is my privilege to welcome you to the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, we are especially pleased that during this, our centennial year, the Association of Art Museum Directors is meeting in Cleveland, as we are that the director of so many museums were able to join us. The presence of AAMD in Cleveland seems especially apt since this year also marks the 100th anniversary of that organization and since our own director, Frederick Whiting, was a founding member and of course here we are in the midst of our own centennial. From the outset, it has been the mission of the Cleveland Museum of Art to serve and I quote, all the people forever, but like other museums, while we've sought to make good on that promise and while community engagement is a core value, we have not always succeeded in quite the way that we would like. So despite having made very great strides, particularly in recent years, neither our staff nor our visitors fully reflect the diversity so, that is so very important to the fabric of our city. That's been the subject of much of AAMD's Cleveland meeting, and we are absolutely thrilled to host this afternoon's panel, Arts and Culture in a Changing World, moderated by Thelma Golden. Before I surrender the podium, I do wish to extend our thanks to Jerry Wareham and Kit Jensen of IdeaStream. IdeaStream will be taping today's panel discussion for later broadcast on public radio station 90.3 WCPN and public television station WVIZ channel 25. It will also be live streamed on the WVIZ website. It is now my honor to introduce the amazing Janetta Cole, former president of Spelman and Bennett Colleges, current director of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African Art, a great leader, and for today's purposes, first and foremost, president of the Association of Art Museum Directors, Janetta. The top of the evening to each of you. And on behalf of the Association of Art Museum Directors, I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's panel. It is my view that one of the most important issues that we art museum directors must wrestle with is how we will bring greater diversity and an inclusive culture to our museums. And that means diversifying our boards, our staff, the content of our exhibitions, and certainly our visitorship. Discussing these issues can involve awkward conversations, and difficult dialogues. But as Audre Lorde, the well-known black lesbian poet said, your silence will not protect you. And that is why it is such a good thing that over the course of the last few years, AAMD, the Association of Art Museum Directors, has been far more willing to speak up and speak out about the need for greater diversity, the need for greater accessibility and inclusion in North American art museums. We are all grateful to our association's executive director, Christine Anagnos, for her persistent attention to our responsibility to engage with these critical issues. I also want to acknowledge a colleague, Marriott Westerman, Vice President at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. During the AAMD presidency of Susan Taylor, we at AAMD joined with the American Alliance of Museum in working with the Mellon Foundation to carry out the first ever comprehensive survey that assesses the ethnic and gender diversity of the staffs of art museums across the United States. Now that we know where we are on the question of diversity and inclusion, we know where we must go. Many, many thanks, Bill Griswold, 
to you and your colleagues, your board, at the Cleveland Museum of Art for facilitating this evening's conversation. The conversation will be moderated by Thelma Golden. I can say to you that under her moderating, we are in for a very important, and it could be a somewhat, I won't say disturbing, but unsettling conversation. And is that not what we need in order to move forward? As most of you know, Thelma Golden is the acclaimed director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem. She will be joined this evening by Jeff Chang, executive director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford University. Also joining Thelma Golden, Kathy Winter, program manager, Diversity City on Board, Global Diversity Exchange at the Ted Rogers School of Management, Ryerson University. We have ourselves quite a panel. We certainly have, as a topic, one of high importance. Let us welcome the panel. I just want to say, as a member of the Association of Art Museum Directors, how thrilled and proud I am to be here, to be in this conversation with these two amazing individuals, and to be among my colleagues and peers for these few days where we are talking about a topic that is incredibly important to me. I'm also thrilled, though, to welcome here tonight this wonderful audience because it means to me that you all are as interested as we are in this idea of arts and culture in a changing world. That's the title of our panel, but in some ways what we're really talking about is arts and culture in a diverse world. And so to begin, both of you, Kathy and Jeff, in your day-to-day -day lives um, outside of our art and museum world are involved in this notion of diversity. And I want to ask you all, um, quoting Anna Holmes in her fantastic New York Times Magazine article when she says, how does a word like diversity become so muddled that it loses much of its meaning? How does it go from communicating something idealistic to something cynical and suspect? Mm -hmm. So to start this conversation, you know, the place at which we are is with, as Dr. Cole just said, this deep, deep, deep desire and intention knowing of knowing where we want to go in the museum field. But tell us, let's start with language. How did the term diversity come to be such a lightning rod as opposed to an ideal that we imagine in a democratic society that we aspire to? Well, I, I work at, a, at an institute. I run an institute at Stanford University that obviously has diversity in its title. Um, and yet, uh, when I spoke to Anna, and when I speak mm -hmm. to people about the word diversity, I, I can't help but have that little ironic button in my head go off a little bit. Um, the, the word diversity in some ways has become denatured almost, mm. I think. Um, it at one time was a pretty radical idea. You know, when we were talking about the 1960s moving into the 1970s, um, to even invoke the word diversity was to suggest um, that there, were, there could be multiple ways of being American. Uh, and by now, multiculturalism is sort of a, a fait accompli, right? Um, and in some ways, the notion of diversity uh, feels uh, empty. I, I, I went to uh, give a talk at the University uh, of Texas, actually, um, and was speaking to a, a multicultural center director there. Uh, during Diversity Week. 
I was there to give the Diversity Week keynote. And she talked to me about how the word diversity for many white students had come to mean them. They didn't show up to the Diversity Week events because diversity meant the other folks. And that was uh, news to me, that the word diversity, which I thought included everybody, mm -hmm. had suddenly meant uh, everybody but white. Um, and, and so I think that that's uh, something that we uh, can point to as a way of understanding what it's become. Mm -hmm. It's become sort of a catch-all to talk about our continuing lack of access and continuing lack of under uh, representation uh, for different types of groups. And, and I think that in that way, um, uh, it, it's become almost easier to box up and set aside. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kathy, can you first describe to us a little bit of your work that you're doing in Canada? because I think it provides for us some ways to think um, about what we're talking about here, but also speak about what this word diversity means, what it means and what it should mean. Certainly, and thank you so very much for inviting a Canadian to come to speak about this. Um, you know, we, Toronto, the greater Toronto area has been acclaimed once again as the most diverse city in the world. There are over 400, um, 400 dialects being spoken, over 100 eth ethnicities, very, very diverse. And when we looked around the boardrooms of the city, we did a survey of the most diverse municipalities within the region, um, which had 49.5% what we call visible minority, and that's non-white. Um, we're at the majority now, they've got to find another name, but anyway. Um, and what we found when we looked at the positions of power and influence, the leadership positions, the boards, the school board trustees, the politicians, was that only 13.5% of people in those leadership positions were visible minority. And what we concluded was, our city is diverse, its leadership is not. So we wanted to do something about this. So we asked the organizations, how come you don't have diverse individuals on your boards? We can't find them. We asked qualified individuals, visible minority individuals, um, who we knew were on the, 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 the leadership track, how come you're not applying for these positions? Well, no one's asked us, we've never heard of them. So what my work does, we connect individuals from diverse backgrounds to opportunities, key word, on governance boards in the not-for-profit sector and in the public sectors. And it's not about tokenism, it's about merit. So we train all these individuals on governance competencies so that they have the competencies to serve on a board. The evaluations have been fantastic um, from both sides. And what it also does, not only providing the opportunity excuse me, but what the individuals have told us, it provides professional networks for them that they would not have had in their own day-to-day -day living. And that is a precursor to social inclusion. They feel included, another key word that must be paired with diversity for diversity to have any meaning. So the second part of your question, um, Thelma, what diversity means, it's really about all of us. Um, you know, how we choose to live our lives, how we define families, we're able, disabled, you know, we're, we're gay, we're straight, we're same-sex couples, it's, we're old, we're all getting there. Um, it, it's about everything. It's about religion, it's about culture. Um, it's about diversity of thought. When you have all these diverse people contributing, there's diversity of thought. And as Einstein once said, if we all think alike, no one thinks very much. <laughs> um, so it must be paired, though, to have its true value with inclusion. And maybe that's another question we yes. want to ask. Well, I, I would love to talk about that because it, it seems that <coughs> when we're thinking about the ideal of diversity in our cities, in our academic institutions, in our museums, inclusion has to be part of that conversation. But I, I want you both to tell us why. I think it's a matter of equity. And for me, I think that 
<laughs> the, in the way that you uh, say that di diversity needs to be paired with inclusion, I'd say that diversity needs to be paired with an argument for equity. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is, is that uh, it's really about providing access, equal access, uh, equal representation, um, and sharing of power. Um, and I think that that's sort of what, what has been denatured from the word diversity. Um, the notions of inclusion, the notions of equity that we should be all striving for uh, socially in our societies. Um, I, you know, we're at this particular point, I think, in history, and we come to it every generation, where we sort of look at these questions of equity, um, inclusion, diversity, and sort of reevaluate where we've come. And they, they come because of sharp, you know, dramatic moments that happen um, in our society. Um, but we, keep, we continue to revisit them, I think, because we haven't attended to these questions that are underlying mm -hmm. of what it really means to be able to uh, open up the institutions, what it means to be able to rethink uh, our arts institutions in the context of this very uh, dramatically changing society. Um, and so uh, equity, I think, is, is the way that I, I, I kind of describe what you, I think, are, are talking about with, refer, with respect to to inclusion? For me, um, inclusion is feeling that you belong. It's not about tokenism. It's not about bums on seats. It's not about a different type of person, different colored person, um, an able person or disabled person um, to check off a box. It's, it's about a feeling of belonging, of, about, of, of being, of contributing. Um, it's not about being a, a token. Um, it's like being invited to dinner and being asked to partake of the meal, to be, to be part mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. um, and study, there are many studies that show that once people feel valued, feel that they're contributing, feel that they're making a difference, that their voice counts. Oh, and I had that idea, and they've actually listened to me and implemented it. it, it it's that, it's that, it's a feeling. It's a feeling, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all well aware of, you know, all of the ways in which the various studies have let us know that diversity creates better organizations, right. smarter organizations, mm -hmm. more effective organizations. But yet, m quite often, it is not achieved. What, what makes that happen? What makes it happen that there isn't a way that these intentions play out into actual change. Now, Jeff, you just talked about this from a generational point of view, the mm -hmm. way in which we might revisit this. And I will say, to the credit of AAMD, they have looked at this issue and made many, many um, efforts in the past to think about the ways in which the art museum field could approach in those specific moments what this means. But let's talk about, I want to start with you, Kathy, when you, you're talking about in, uh, civic environments, right? Where, you know, we're talking about the life of people in cities. What makes it that this does not happen? It's very aspirational. Mm -hmm. And I think it does not happen because of intentionality. Aspirations with no action is just a bunch of hot air. You've got to have the, the intention um, to do something about it. Um, and it's not easy. Change is difficult. This is systemic change, mm -hmm. which means it's even more difficult. Um, so you have to have the right ingredients in place. You can't do it alone. You have to have a collective effort by various sectors within the community, public, private, corporate, stakeholders, community. Um, you also have to be the, what I've read termed as the unapologetic leader, in that you have to be courageous and make that change. And you have to get the tools to do it as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, our program provides that tool, the how-to, um, to connect. It's an actual tool that helps you connect. But I would say that you have to be 
the courageous leader to get it done and take action. And it'll take time, uh, but to, being from Canada, to quote, you know, Wayne Gretzky, I miss, <laughs> I miss 100% of the shots I don't take. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be intentional. You've got to take them, and it'll take time. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of build on that, I think that courage is, is, is huge. Um, these are not easy things to do because it's easier for us to actually do nothing. Right. Um, and when we do nothing, the, uh, the sort of systems that are already in place that, that uh, preserve underrepresentation, that preserve lack of access, that preserve lack of equity uh, continue. Um, and, and so courage Backbone, it's huge. There's going to always be a backlash, I think, yeah. when somebody tries to take a stand around questions of equity, around questions of diversity, um, because it's shaking up the very uh, basis of, of the way that, that certain kinds of things are uh, being distributed, certain kinds of things are, are being uh, produced uh, and consumed. And, and, and so it, it's crucial, I think, uh, to be able to persevere through these backlashes, to be able to stay the course. Um, but the, the, the imperative is not just for the immediate moment. I think the imperative is for two generations, three generations down the line. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's uh, the kind of vision that we have to have. We're in this very divided historical moment. This is exactly the time when arts institutions uh, should be uh, helping us to see each other a lot better, um, but we also have to keep our eyes uh, two or three generations down the line. And if I could just mm -hmm. add, yeah. um, Thelma, it's also about disrupting the status quo, mm -hmm. which is, um, may feel threatened. Leadership is a lot about power and influence, and if you disrupt that, people might feel threatened and fearful about that. So it's, it's difficult. That's why you've got to be courageous and fearless. But to your point, Jeff, about this being about two or three generations ahead of us, mm -hmm. we understand that the demographics mean that two or three generations ahead of us are a very different nation than we have now. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So it seems that the simple equation here is that the de demographics themselves will resolve this, right? Mm, mm -hmm. This country will be majority people of color. Mm -hmm. Does that in any way change the way in which you think about the need for change now? Now I'm being provocative, I know. Yeah, no, absolutely. This, I want you. I, you know, the thing is, is, is that uh, numbers alone aren't gonna change things. Um, I think that we have to be able to create vehicles for people to be able to, to learn, mm -hmm. to, to step up, to get into the pipeline, uh, to take, uh, positions and and to bring their perspectives, be allowed to bring their perspectives um, into these different types of positions mm -hmm. that that then produce the organization, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. To use sort of academic speak. Um, but what I think I'm trying to say here is is that we need to have a cultural shift, right? We have to have not just uh, a number shift. We have to have a cultural shift within organizations to be able to rethink what art institutions mean in a changing society. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of alluded to this in the last answer. I think that art institutions uh, during times of uh, conformity should be uh, helping us to think about alternatives. And I think that art institutions during times of institutions can be helping us to think about uh, how to come together. Mm -hmm. um, these are the kinds of places where the ideas that allow us to adapt as a society, as a community uh, are promulgated. Uh, are passed on to generations. And, uh, and we have to be able to reflect that, I think, in our organizational, our institutional practices as well. Mm -hmm. um, in your book, mm -hmm. Who We Be, The Colorization of America, mm -hmm. which I encourage you all <laughs> to read, commercial for it, Jeff's book, <laughs> but important, mm -hmm. because what you do is you trace this through culture. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about another moment in our recent cultural history where you've seen the sort of culture itself, right, the art being produced, create a cultural shift that has allowed us to understand diversity, equity, parity in a different way? Well, sadly, I think the, the, the perfect analogy is the 1990s, right, and the culture wars. Um, I think that we're in a moment right now 
during which a lot of the same arguments that were used to divide Americans, uh, North Americans, uh, around lines of culture and race are, are being resuscitated, mm -hmm. are being brought back. Um, and I think that during that particular moment, what, what we saw was artists trying to uh, show how the country was changing, how the country was shifting. Um, and, and I think that, that what we saw was a pushback uh, coming from political sectors mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and other parts of the culture against that kind of a thing. Um, and so, you know, if we look at what's happening now in the context of sort of these reflaring of the culture wars, um, it gives us a little bit of a different type of perspective. Um, it makes things feel a little bit more urgent, um, but it should also give us, I think, hope to be able to think about the idea that we might be able to get it right this time and move past. And so, you know, one of the, the lines that I use in, in the talks that I give is that we can look at 1965 right, during the, the Watts riots, 1992 Los Angeles uh, riots, and, and then we can look at the past two, three years, um, and, and these are the times in which this conversation comes back to the fore. What if we don't have to wait for 2042 um, to come back to this again? What if we actually got on uh, board and, and started working on this right now? Um, I think that, that that's the kind of future that our, our kids, our grandkids would, would want to have. We just have an example. Yeah. Yes. Um, TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, now an economic powerhouse. But when it started, it was in response to the audience, the international audience, the demographics, the diversity. And its first interest was in international films for that audience. So again, you know, looking ahead, um, there, that was that response then, but now it's just, you know, Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in her um, 2014 TED Talk, Melody Hobson, who's the president of Ariel Investments in Chicago, gave a TED Talk, and the title was Color Blind or Color Brave? Mm -hmm. Question mark. In which she poses the sort of complexity of talking about race, right? And that color blindness is actually a dangerous position, though often held out as an ideal. And that to be color brave means to take on the hard, uncomfortable conversations in our workplaces, in our communities about race as it relates to these issues of equity, parity, inclusion, and power. How do, how do we have these conversations in a productive way? Now, I say this in the midst of a complicated political moment, right? So when I say productive, I mean productive, respectful, in ways that sort of open up possibility as opposed to close them down and are reactive. Mm. Wow, that's a tough question. Well, I know, but it's, isn't it the question? <laughs> it's the question. Isn't it the question? It's the question, Kathy right? has the answer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, Kathy, he's giving it to you. <laughs> I know this, I know this. Um, well, I, you know, I think that the conversation needs to happen at all the different parts of the spectrum. Um, so on the one hand, we have to be able to turn the volume down, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be able to have honest conversations um, from the point of view of, of, of trying to honestly understand mm -hmm. uh, where other sides are coming from, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think that that's just a practice that, that, that uh, we probably don't use enough. Mm -hmm. Certainly in, in, in US culture, probably mm -hmm. we don't use it enough. Um, it's all about the internet hot takes and that kind of thing. Um, it's much easier to do that kind of thing. But we also have to be able to allow for artists who want to be provocative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, this brings up the, the, uh, the, the sort of ideas of the early 90s when artists were trying to deliberately be provocative mm -hmm. in order to say society is much more diverse, society is much more complicated uh, than we would like to imagine it, and that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I think that, that in that regard, uh, I think the color blind versus color brave, uh, other folks use the word color mute, mm. right? Uh, color mute, that, it's, that there's a sort of silencing that people don't want to talk about this, mm -hmm. that it's much more polite not to talk about mm -hmm. it. Um, I think that there are polite ways to talk about impolite topics. Um, and I think that there are impolite ways to talk about impolite topics. And as, as folks who work in the arts, we need to be able to foster the conversation along the whole spectrum from providing safe spaces, mm -hmm. uh, which we try to do, and we tell our students at the same time, 
these aren't going to be perfectly safe spaces. Mm -hmm. People need to express themselves. That's why you're in the arts, isn't it? Uh, but on the other hand, to be able to have uh, arts being able to be in your face mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's well, the best answer I can give right now. Well, no, and yeah. I think what's so amazing about your answer is this is where I see the possibility because mm -hmm. we are in the arts, right? right? Mm -hmm. And as art museums, we often take on the role of allowing for interpretation to come in the space of big universal questions, right? And creating mm -hmm. space in which not only the contemplation with a work of art, but with each other in the space of art, right. gives us the opportunity to think through difference in ways that are poetic and powerful and profound. So that that seems to be at a base where in the arts, in art museums, we actually can come to this with some power. Right? Right, as right, opposed right, right, right. to a place of deficit. And I think because your writing has always taken on culture, is that how you see this particular issue, diversity, as it relates to the arts and in your role running an institute about wow, this? Wow, that's a great question. I think maybe there's the spectrum of us trying to be able to create practices that individually allow us to be able to have these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. That's certainly what I try to do uh, with the institute, through the institute. Um, and in the different types of work that I do outside of uh, Stanford uh, in the larger arts and activist community, mm -hmm. uh, communities, mm -hmm. um, is to be able to have these spaces where people can be able to have these honest, open, mm -hmm. deep mm -hmm. discussions. Those are transformative, mm -hmm. right? And I think that this goes back to the point that you're making, that we're all around the table. Uh, we're, we're probably having a meal together, right? This is the Malcolm X uh, analogy, mm -hmm. right? You uh, are are not allowing me to eat at the table. No, we should all be allowed to be around the table and to have these kinds of conversations, mm -hmm. not so that they end up in a food fight, right? right? right. Uh, but right. at the same time, to be able to, to, to note that artists are the folks who are gonna be trying to find those seams mm -hmm. where the contradictions are happening mm -hmm. within society, where the hypocrisies are happening mm -hmm. within society, and they should. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of uh, what artists do so well. It's not only what they do so well, mm -hmm. um, but it's part of what they do really well. And during times, again, uh, uh, of unity, those are the times when maybe, you know, that can be pushed. And during times of division, maybe we need to be having uh, things that bring us together more. I don't know. It's, 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 it, but the spectrum, I think, is really crucial. And you can't start those conversations if you haven't invited people to the table. Yeah? So, yeah. And Kathy, in the public sphere, how do we as leaders sort of embody the sort of best practice as being communicators around these ideas of, of bringing people to the table? I mean, in real practical terms, what would you say to someone who says, okay, I, I do want these values to be a part of my institution, but very practically I want to understand, you know, how to be the person who begins this conversation, complicated, hard, difficult, sometimes unwanted. How do I do that? I think it's all about governance. Mm -hmm. Boards of directors have the power to allocate resources, to hire the right staff, to shape the agenda, to shift the conversation, to make the difference. They're the lever for, mm -hmm. for that change. And I think it has to start there mm -hmm. and then filter through the organization. Mm -hmm. um, so it, then it goes down to your, your, C, your CEO, yeah. mm -hmm. the person who's, you know, boards of directors, they also set the policy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. And then it has to be intentional and um, no quick fix. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Relentless incrementalism. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Good. Okay, hashtag. Where, <laughs> there we go. Uh, where, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's, right. it's you know, stick to it you mm -hmm. know. Being, it's, it's just, it's, you know, it's, but I think that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Because th that's the level mm -hmm. of the organization that has the power and the influence to make that change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm very conscious that the three of us are sitting here having this conversation um, because we also know that for the conversation to be important, it has to include 
many people, mm. right? You know, the, the work we're talking about for some of us seems like we are trying to get to our version, right, of normal. You know, the amazing Shonda Rhimes says that. You know, she's not <laughs> diversifying TV. Mm -hmm. She's normalizing it. Right? Right. She makes yeah. TV right. that looks right. like the world that mm. she lives in. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that who speaks about this, right? And, and who has a voice in it, but also who comes to the table becomes very important. Mm -hmm. So how do we do this work in the face of resistance, right? In, this, in the face of a lack of desire for change, or more significantly, in the face of an idea that to embody and practice these ideals that we are somehow lowering standards. Mm -hmm. Kathy, do you wanna? I think you have to show the examples that work and link it to the bottom line. Uh, link it to your financial resources, your funding, and show examples that work. For example, um, one of the largest uh, banks in, in Canada uh, changed its, it's not an arts example, but mm -hmm. it's an example of adjust, adjustment, uh, changed the mortgage el el eligibility criteria, mm -hmm. um, which was based on a single family owning a home. And because of the large number of immigrants that are coming in, um, they choose, to, they, they, the families, immigrant families, choose to, to pool their resources and, buy a, and live in a house. But the mortgage criteria was just for a single family. But in these multiple family homes, you've got you know, the family and then the family of the brother and the family of the, the husband's sister. Um, so what they did, they got immigrants to be part of the the task force looking at how we can do this. Mm -hmm. And what they said to the CEO was that you're missing a huge opportunity. So they, lo they adjusted the mortgage criteria you know, to allow for multiple families. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's looking at your bottom line in terms of your market share, what you're losing out on. Um, and yes, it's a nice thing to do, mm -hmm. but it's also the business thing to do. So mm -hmm. I think you've got to look at it too from the business perspective. Mm -hmm. And maybe to, to answer the question slightly differently, mm -hmm. uh, what your example makes me think of is that we have standards, we have guidelines, but the guidelines and the standards reflect what our values are. Yeah. So before we get to the standards, yeah. before we get to the guidelines, we have the values that we want to basically right. uphold, that we want to push out there. Mm -hmm. In this case, the value was of being able to offer housing, right. affordable housing for, for families in need, right? And, and I think in this particular instance, uh, you know, we can, we can uphold standards uh, that are reflexive, that sort of mm -hmm. allow us to be able to, to justify uh, how the institutions and why the institutions should continue to sort of remain the same. Mm -hmm. But I think that the institution of the future is the one that's gonna be looking at centrally what its role is gonna be in the community that it's in. Mm -hmm. And I think that in order to be able to have an institution that's responsive mm -hmm. to the community, inclusion and equity are, are basic types of, of values mm -hmm. that should undergird sort of what the standards are gonna be. Mm -hmm. um, and so we change standards all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, for generations and generations, every generation comes up with a new standard. Mm -hmm. uh, people. I, I come from hip hop, so the kids dance a certain kind of way, and I say, well, that's cool. We did it better back in the day. <laughs> um, you know, and, and they say, well, actually, we're not, in, we're not into that anymore. We're into this now, right? So the standards are changing. They're mm -hmm. changing every single day. Mm -hmm. What should stay fixed are our values. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in diverse societies, mm -hmm. uh, the diverse societies that we're working in, equity and inclusion should be our core values. Fine. So Jeff, what does an equitable, inclusive art museum look like to you? I think that I don't have all the answers, uh, which is why I'm not a museum director. Uh, See, we were hoping and I'm an you academic. Would give, give them to us. <laughs> um, 
But I, I really love um, what an arts institution in, in my area is doing, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, uh, which is to, again, sort of rethink what it is that they are doing in, in response to the San Francisco community and the larger San Francisco Bay Area community. Um, and that's to do things such as to make membership sort of, you know, uh, uh, pay what you will, pay what mm -hmm. you can, right? Mm -hmm. um, to be able to do a lot of events that are not necessarily based within the institution itself, right? Mm -hmm. To break down the four walls. Uh, the larger idea is to think of of, of Yerba Buena to, in what we are kind of coming to call a creative ecosystem, right? And, and so to think about how it is that we make communities more creative, more generative, mm -hmm. uh, sustainable, mm -hmm. uh, and that art is at the, uh, is at the core of that, right? Mm -hmm. that, that the human impulse to be able to create mm -hmm. uh, extends from everything from making uh, a pot or a painting or a dance uh, to making a community, right? And, and that's what's sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, all the other kinds of things intrude, such as budgets and those kinds of things. But these are the, the sort of higher principles that they're, they're working from. It's a grand experiment. I'm really excited about what mm -hmm. they're doing. Mm -hmm. And Kathy, when you look at these cities that you're working with across Canada, what are the immediate sort of positive effects of diversity and inclusion and parity? Like, what are you seeing at the ground level in these cities? People are given the opportunity to connect on boards, to become part of the power and influence, part of the lever that's making the, the decisions. Mm -hmm. And we, we facilitated over 700 appointments to boards for anything from a small shelter to the Royal Ontario Museum. Mm -hmm. And what both sides told us was that it added value to the discussions at the table mm -hmm. because there was diversity of thought, diversity of perspectives. Um, they got rid of the groupthink mentality because they asked, these individuals asked questions and they felt competent to ask the questions because they had the training. And what they told us was that it opened for them professional and personal networks that they would not have had. And it provided, it provided the, the knowledge to people in their community as well that if you can do it, I can too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it, it's, it's shifting you know, the thought process. Mm -hmm. So with, you know, we've spent these two days thinking about these issues, talking about them, looking at ways to make all of these ideas actionable. What should we be looking to avoid? Right? What would you say is the biggest impediment? What, what would you say is the roadblock that's just right down the road, right? That we need to be most conscious of in setting out to sort of think about how to bring this conversation into our organizations or into our communities, to the places in which we, we also have roles as civic leaders, as art museum directors? Um, I hesitate to say this one uh, because I, I have, I can see why folks do it, but I also think that it's, it's, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of institutions will appoint sort of a chief diversity officer. It's huge in the universities. Mm -hmm. um, that gives sort of a target, a person with a target on their back mm -hmm. if things go wrong, mm. right? Um, but I, what I think has to happen is, is it has to be a larger institutional mm -hmm. shift, right? Mm -hmm. There needs to be a, a culture shift mm -hmm. within the organization. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, and a lot of institutions appoint a chief diversity officer w not necessarily thinking that they're gonna put the target on that person's back, wow. right? Um, but what I'm trying to say is, is that everybody in the organization mm -hmm. should be thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, everybody in the organization should be engaged in a sort of cultural shift. Mm -hmm. It should be a shift within the organization that reorients the entirety of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people should be free to be able to, to percolate, to think, to dream, to sort of put craziest ideas on the table, mm -hmm. right? 
um, because it's part of the adaptability process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of an institution. And I think this is what you're alluding to in, in terms of right, the benefits, benefits. For, for, for organizations. Uh, and so it, what, I, what, what we shouldn't be doing is to, is to fall into that trap mm. of allowing it to be coordinated by somebody to have that be their little sector of, of work. Uh, it has to happen across the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Avoid tokenism. It's a lose-lose. We did a study as well that showed that more diversity leads to more benefits. If there's just the token there, one person, you're seen as a token. Mm -hmm. Two people, you're an interest group. <laughs> it's only when there's 30%, like three out of 10 happen, mm. that real change happens. Mm -hmm. And the other point that I would make too is, yes, there are structural barriers that have to be addressed, but don't forget the psychological barriers on the person who feels that I don't quite belong. Mm. Um, you have to take that into consideration the same way that others have to, to adapt to norms and learn new norms and learn about new ways of doing things. We have to as well. You have to as well. It takes two to clap. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's joint. May I ask a question? Yes, so, you can. Kat, so when, when you talk about that, that, that feeling of belonging, does that shift as people move further into the process, organizations move further into the process uh, of diversifying their organizations? Yes, yes it does. And how do, how do you deal with that second level and third level and fourth level of questioning that happens as, as you move through that process? Training is important. Mm -hmm. We don't know it all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Training both ends, mm -hmm. the person coming in and the people that are already there, very, mm -hmm. very important, mm -hmm. yeah. Particularly diversity and inclusion training. Mm -hmm. Um, unconscious bias training. We all have biases, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And the bias is primarily for people that look like us, mm -hmm. not against people that don't look like us. Mm -hmm. So training is very important for that to be successful. Mm -hmm. I know, as my museum director colleagues will know, I did not see the gorilla today. So <laughs> they know what I'm talking about. Um, it's the basketball. So we all, yes, yeah. <laughs> right? I didn't see the gorilla. So I am going to open this up to questions. And there are two microphones right here um, on both sides of the stage. I'm going to ask anyone who would like to ask these two incredible individuals a question to please come up, identify themselves, and then direct their question to Kathy or Jeff, please. Oh, great. Hello. Everyone. My name is Pierre Napier. I am the co-founder of the New Black Democratic Party of Cuyahoga County, 137 bullet strong. Born out of the massacre on the 29th of November 2012 of Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams. Here's what I would like to share with you guys tonight. More than 50 years ago, the, coroner re the current report said that America was moving in two directions, two societies, one black and one white. Today, the 23rd of May 2016, America has arrived at those two societies. Our government, the federal government right now, Cleveland, the potential host city of the Republican National Convention brings to town the white supremacy movement. This country has been predicated on racism for more than 400 years, and I don't see it ending no time soon. We are closer to separation than unity. Race, R-A-C-E, just like sex, S-E-X, those are two areas that Americans refuse to address and talk about. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Question. Okay. I'm so happy to follow that. Mm -hmm. um, I can see you. 
I'm with the YWCA, and our mission is eliminating racism and empowering women. And we have tools that you talked about, how to, to give people a chance to talk and, and ways to do that. What we find is difficulty in getting people to invest in that type of forum. Mm -hmm. That's where our challenge is. And I'm sure at the arts is always if fundraising as well. So how do you get people to invest in something that's maybe uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. I think, Kathy, you spoke a bit to that um, when you spoke about the way in which understanding the sort of ultimate benefit, benefit. of this work Right. then creates the opportunity to understand it as an investment. But I think that is the challenge and why when we talk about this sort of leadership paradigm of being able to speak to the importance of this work equal to the importance of those values that in many cases are easily supported, that we bring them together and that's what creates change in our institutions. But that's really the hard work, and that's what I think you're experiencing in the work that you're doing, and that we in the art museum field are seeing as well as being a real important way in which we shift our institutions to be able to get this work done. You know, may I add to yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the other thing about it is that we do have to look at the larger question of cultural equity, mm -hmm. of the foundation money, the philanthropic money that's been given out, um, something like, 11 cents on the dollar goes to the arts. Mm -hmm. So we're already kind of way behind mm -hmm. in the arts. Five and a half cents goes to organizations that have budgets of larger than $5 million. Um, something like one cent goes to organizations that are serving underrepresented communities. And half a cent, less than half a cent, goes to uh, arts organizations that are working around questions of social justice. Uh, and so art world inequality is mm -hmm. actually more severe than it is uh, in terms of income inequality in the entire U.S. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a larger issue mm -hmm. that we, we have to be able to look at uh, and to address uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a much bigger way moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ian Charnas. I work across the street at Case Western Reserve University. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to take what's called a safe zone training, which you, uh, many people here may be familiar with. It's offered by the LGBT Center on campus, and it offers <clears throat> a, a platform uh, to discuss and to learn about LGBT issues. And I was curious for the, for the three of you, if you have seen any similar trainings to uh, discuss and engage in race at universities um, or other institutions, uh, models for, for training or, or discussing those topics. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, there, there are um, quite a few. I think that you know, what we saw was after the 1990s, a lot of training programs were set up, multicultural training programs, mm -hmm. uh, diversity training programs. Uh, at Stanford, it's a requirement that all new incoming freshmen go through um, uh, a training. Not a, it's, it's not so much a training as a program around questions of diversity mm -hmm. uh, that include um, all kinds of issues of trauma. Uh, we're not just talking about marginalized identities, but we're talking about a lot of other types of issues as well. And, uh, and so what I think, though, has happened in, in many respects is that, you know, thanks to um, sort of recurring budget cuts over the years, those are a lot of times the first programs that are eliminated. Mm -hmm. um, we're most fragile. This is not nothing new. Yeah. Wow. This is this is not a new story at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we need to be able to to argue for these programs in the context of what it is that we're heading towards, which is a much much more diverse society mm -hmm. each and every year. Mm -hmm. So, right. yeah. And I think that we just also know that in many cases. It's a question of training and these opportunities, but also partnering, you know, as the first commenter brought into the room, in those organizations dealing with the root issues of racism, mm -hmm. right? And sexism and homophobia and working with them in creating some shared agenda around the elimination of those issues while we are also sort of talking about the training needed within our institutions to create new spaces. I'm gonna go over here first and then to you. Sharon. Uh, my name is Donald Black Jr. 
very briefly, um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm uh, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I attended Cleveland School of the Arts. I've been coming to this museum on a regular basis since 1989. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I didn't know that I was supposed to see myself reflected in the work on the wall. Um, and I believe I followed a lot of the rules that the, the, the predominantly white teachers told me uh, to, to be able to get into the museum, you know, for lack of a better word. What I wanted to ask, and this is to Kathy, um, if you could possibly share some insight on the role that artists take making a decision to exclude themselves intentionally out of feeling what you described as not fitting in, how would that start to affect the institution? I think it affects the institution because the institution, if people don't see themselves represented in the institution, then it affects the institution in terms of missing a whole market share that they can have. Um, and the institution then is not, doesn't be, become part of that community either. So it, it loses out because it's losing out not only from the, what those people can bring to the institution, but also from a market and funding perspective, what the institution can get from that community as well. And I think what you're speaking to really, you know, again, is the work itself, right? How institutions allow for all of us to experience through art the ability to see ourselves as artists, as citizens, you know, in, in the world. And I think that, you know, is the work that many institutions are taking very seriously. I know I work in an institution founded based on the idea of creating an institutional space in which the ideals of a diverse society would be root to what we were, but it was also a reactive stance, right, to exclusion. Mm. So now that we can have this conversation where we understand exclusion, right, and its effect right, bad art history is a lack mm. of sort of parody and understanding of art, we can understand the way in which all institutions can engage in this work and it not just be a reactive stance of the culturally specific, but one that we can all engage in together. And maybe just to add to, mm -hmm, to that is, it's not just about being able to see ourselves, right. although that's right. fundamental, yeah. that's absolutely fundamental, mm -hmm. but it's about all of us being able to see each other, I think. Right. Exactly. Ultimately, <laughs> exactly. and I think that that's uh, exactly. speaking. I think to what the first gentleman was yeah. talking about. Yeah. I mean, these are what justice movements are about. About trying to help us exactly. to see each other mm -hmm. in a much more, uh, you know, broad type of way. I think the work mm -hmm. that you've done as a curator helped me to be able to see a lot better. Um, and I think that you know, diversifying mm -hmm. our staffs, diversifying mm -hmm. our, our curators, yeah. our education folks, yeah. our directors. Um, that's part of what that's about. Right. So. We have time for one more question. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to try not to be nervous. Um, my name is Samantha Thomas, and I'm a Cleveland resident, former public school teacher, um, former business consultant. Anyway, um, I, I was listening to what you were saying and, and thinking about how to move forward. As a, as a teacher, you learn to plan with the end in mind when you're you know, doing your daily lessons and such. And I was thinking about the bottom line that you mentioned before in terms of being an incentive, like how do you get, how do you get your kids to, you know, bite onto what you want them to do? And um, I think that, that that is key in terms of looking at what is the incentive for the people who are in power to share their power? How does that shift my bottom line? How does that, um, expand my vision, how does that help me as a, as a business leader, as a um, civic leader, as an arts leader to grow and, de and to develop? And, and what is it that's going to um, get people to buy into the investment that it's going to take? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's my point of questioning is um, the, I believe that the um, systemic racism and the history of slavery that has happened, that I think that the bottom line is that it devalued a group of people. Mm -hmm. And so the basic question or the root question is how do we as a society invest in the value 
of an entire group of people? And is the bottom line shift great enough for people in power to make that investment? And I, I believe it is. <laughs> um, and, I'm, and I guess that is my question to the panel. And I guess to add to the discussion moving forward is what are some creative ways that we as a nation can get people to um, buy into the investment to reevaluate, see the worth mm -hmm. in an entire group of people that, that the worth of people is equitable, that I do have something to contribute, not only to the people in power, but to the people that have experienced this generational, you know, systemic racism, that yes, it is worthy for, yes, I am worthy of being invested in, because after that investment, or even in the present moment, my value is as great as the person who is making the decisions. So I, I hope that was clear, but <laughs> um, I guess what, what are those creative points I, to add to the discussion about how to, one, shift the dialogue to talking about, you know, how can we get the perspective seeing, seeing each other? Mm -hmm. How can we see each other as being as valuable and as worthy as everyone else? no matter what color, no matter what gender. And I think that the problem is, the problem is evidenced in the fact for, for sexism, for example, um, 77 cents to the dollar. You know, I was in, a, I was in an art store and um, I was looking at the art on the walls and everything that had a woman of color in it or on it was discounted 50% to everything mm. else. And mm. I saw that trend mm. and I just, I was <laughs> a little heartbroken about that, um, that everything that was of color was on sale. And so I, that needs to shift. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that one of the base um, root causes that need to be addressed is this issue of worth and what can we what incentives can we give to the people in power to make that investment so that we can all become fully seen as being worthy Kathy do you want to maybe oh it's a tough one yeah <laughs> that's a really tough one mm -hmm. um, the people in power have to change mm. have to change in the, the, the actual person mm. so that there's there's people who have been affected, as you say, take those places to be the gatekeeper, to be the decision maker, to make that change. Mm -hmm. But it's a tough one, it's systemic. Part of the argument is already being made, I think, actually. Uh, for the last 15, 20 years, the big discussion, I think, across the country in terms of arts institutions has been dwindling audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that points directly towards, I mean, we've gotten to a state now where the, the question of audiences is being remeasured so that we can make ourselves feel better, I think, mm -hmm. at night. Um, and, and so this is the urgency, mm -hmm. right? The urgency is, is the fact that audiences are not coming to uh, arts institutions in the ways that they did during the mm -hmm. 1990s, in the ways that they did during the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Um, let alone the 2000s, and mm -hmm. so, uh, so part of the argument has already been made. Mm -hmm. Arts institutions have to change because audiences have changed, the demographics have changed, because there's so many more different types of cultural products on offer mm -hmm. that uh, museums, arts institutions have to change, have to be able to do, do something to be able to, to, to meet that. Um, but the larger question, I think, is going back to equity. Um, it's going back to what we want our society to be able to look like. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that's where we have to reemphasize that arts, arts institutions are institutions in society that reproduce society. Uh, and we have to think, we can't exclude ourselves from the question of thinking about what we want our society to look like mm -hmm. uh, in 20 years, in 30 years, in 50 years. Mm -hmm. Will it be fair? Will it be more just? Will it be more equal? Will it be more, more uh, diverse? Or will it be more unequal? Mm -hmm. Will it be less just? Will it be less diverse? Mm -hmm. so. I think, too, yours. Your first point, 
um, organizations around the world, I think, are addressing that um, to some extent. In Canada, the Arts Council of Canada is now, for the 2017, 2017 fiscal year, is tying uh, their funding allocations to uh, reflection of diversity um, in the back office, in the curator role, in the audience, um, in the administration, in the board of directors, um, that the, the, there must be a reflection of, of diversity in all those aspects um, in order to, the reflection of diversity of the, which reflects the geographic, look, read the region, so if you're in Greater Toronto area, for example, your reflection will be much higher than if you're in um, another area that's not as, as diverse. Um, and that's tied to your funding allocation. Mm -hmm. um, in the, the Arts Council of England is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that has resulted in an increase in what they call BME, um, black minority and ethnic individuals. In again, the, the curator role, the backstage, the, the ballet, the opera, the administration, the board. Um, so again, mm -hmm. that will have an effect mm -hmm. in changing the composition, mm -hmm. which will then have another compounding effect in the, mm -hmm. the art shown, the ballet done, the opera done, and then on the audience. Mm -hmm. But it seems that we know that the answer begins with the conversation that puts equity and parity and inclusion on the table. On table. And Absolutely. I'm glad everyone was here today to have this conversation with us. And I want to thank you, Kathy, and you, Jeff, thank for you. being thank here you, and contributing so amazingly to this conversation. Thank you. And I would just like to reiterate Thelma's thanks. Uh, thanks to the panel. Thank you, Thelma. It's just wonderful to have you here. Um, wonderful that all of you could be here for this discussion, which is clearly an ongoing one. Uh, please enjoy the evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>